Loving God and Father, as we just sang, we pray that you would reveal your truths to us. Open our eyes to see the truth of your word. Speak to our hearts, speak to our wills. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated. If you don't have a Bible or didn't bring one with you, there should be one near you, nearby, uh, one of the Pew Bibles. I'd encourage you to get that out. We will be looking at that shortly, uh, but it's going to take me a minute to get there. Um, a woman was missing her grandchildren uh, desperately, and she lived on the East Coast, and they lived on the West Coast. So she got a flight, and she's going to fly from East Coast to West Coast, and she doesn't like to fly. It makes her nervous. And so she brings her Bible along with her, and that comforts her. And as the plane was taxiing from the, the terminal out to the runway to take off, she pulled her Bible out, and the man next to her, kind of looked askance at her, uh, didn't say anything. Uh, she continued to read her Bible. When they got to cruising altitude, uh, the man turned to her and said, surely you don't believe the stuff that's in that book. And she said, well, of course I do. It's the Bible. Well, how about that guy who was swallowed by a whale? And she said, oh, Jonah? Yeah, I believe that. It's in the Bible. Well, how did he survive in the belly of a whale for three days with no oxygen? She said, I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. And he said to her, well, what if he's not in heaven? And she said, well, then you can ask him. <laughs> a few years ago, there was a bumper sticker, question authority. And uh, that is appropriate. Um, authorities should be held accountable. We should qu ask questions about their policies, about the reasons why they do the things that they do. That's completely and totally legitimate. Sadly, from that, we have devolved into a culture that is post-Christian and post-modern. One of the hallmarks of post-modern philosophy, Jacques Derrida, Paul Ricoeur, is a hermeneutic of suspicion. We don't believe anything anybody tells us. We, ex we respect no authorities. We believe in, uh, in basically nothing. It's very nihilistic. Um, that's the culture, whether you're aware of it or not, that we are now living in. Um, we no longer question authority, but we demean and we belittle authority. We don't ask questions about policy of our leaders, but we call them names, and we uh, pillory them, and we have ad hominem attacks on their person, not on their beliefs, not on their policies. Um, and this is the world in which we live. Sadly, um, it's a replay from Western uh, civilization, Western culture. It's kind of the times of the Reformation. Um, Luther got into it with the Pope, and it wasn't too many years into the Reformation when uh, the Pope excommunicated Luther with a papal bull, said that you're anathema and you're going to hell, to which Luther uh, responded that uh, you are... Um, I know the answer to that. You are the, the beast, or not the beast, the Antichrist, he says of the Pope, and that the Catholic Church is the whore of Babylon. And uh, Protestants uh, kind of adopted that kind of worldview. So the comments that I make today about the Catholic Church, I don't want you to take them from that context. I want you to understand that I'm talking about medieval Catholicism. I'm not talking about Sacred Heart down the street. But there was, but there was a fight and the fight got down and dirty, and that's kind of the, the outcome of where we are today. Um, and in October, we set aside. So if you're visiting with us, we're thrilled that you're here. Um, but if you're visiting with us, um, you dropped yourself into the third uh, sermon in a series of sermons about the Reformation. And it's particularly about the issue of salvation. There were Latin slogans, there were Latin uh, phrases that the reformers, now when I say that word, the reformers, I mean Luther. But I don't mean just Luther or Melanchthon, his co-worker. I don't mean just Calvin. I don't mean just Zwingli. There were, there were a whole lot of people who wanted to reform the Catholic Church, to bring it back to its biblical base. Luther had no plan to start a whole Protestant wing of the church. He would be appalled to discover that there is a denomination, or several of them, named after himself the Lutheran Church. He'd lose his mind. He believed in one holy Catholic and apostolic church. We just got done confessing our belief in a holy Catholic church. 
Um, what he wanted to do was to bring the church back to its foundations, back to the teachings of the early church fathers, back to the teachings of the scriptures. So what precipitated this whole thing? Well, um, Pope Leo X had a big building program going on, and he was an adept fundraiser. And this was before they invented bingo. And so there was no bingo. There was no Las Vegas night down at the church. They didn't have that either. Um, and so how did they raise money? Well, they raised money by the sale of indulgences. And there was a whole theology of, that grew up around the sale of indulgences. Now, this is medieval Catholicism. So don't go around saying, well, the pastor said the Catholic Church, blah, 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 blah. I'm talking about medieval Catholicism here. Okay, so what is an indulgence? Um, <clears throat> are you ready? <laughs> okay, medieval Catholicism taught that you are saved by God's grace, which is infused, and if you, if you cooperate with that grace, you get more grace. And the more good things you do, hopefully in your life, when they put you on the scales, if you have more good works than bad works, then you get to go to heaven. And if you don't, then if you have just a bunch of venal sins, you go to purgatory, heaven's halfway house, to work those off. And, uh, and if you've died in mortal sin, well, then it's too late and you're just out of luck. Um, and so they built this into their theological system. And so um, most mortals can't quite get to what they need for um, salvation. If you were here the first week, you'll remember that one of the things that drove Luther to the monastery, in addition to making a vow to St. Anne, was that he had no assurance of his salvation. He didn't know if he'd done enough good works against his bad works and whether he was going to spend eons in purgatory or, or not even get to go to heaven at all ever. And he was just in knots about that, spent hours in the confessional trying to get himself shed of all of that stuff. Um, and so he was looking for some assurance of his salvation. Well, they didn't have that, so they announced the sale of indulgences. Pope Leo X and Albrecht, the uh, Archbishop of Mainz, uh, hired for themselves an agent. His name was Johann Tetzel, and he became their agent in Germany. And Tetzel announced that he's selling indulgences. Well, the peasants went out to the backyard and dug up the coffee can with their savings, life savings in it, and they ran in haste to Tetzel. Because if they could get their hands on one of these pieces of paper written in Latin, an indulgence, then they can get grandma out of purgatory, and then they themselves wouldn't go to hell, and so whatever we got to pay, we'll pay. And so he was also a good marketer. He had a little phrase that he liked to use. When the coin in the copper rings, the soul from purgatory springs. Woo! And so... The peasants of Germany were beating feet to Tetzel to give them all their money, and the money was being used to pay Michelangelo to paint the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel. This is true. I'm not making it up. This is what the money was going to. And so the, the, the peasants were going out en masse. When Luther in Wittenberg heard about it, he didn't receive it joyfully and with excitement like the peasants did. Here's a chance for the assurance of salvation. It drove him insane. He has now been in the, the theological school there. He's a doctor of theology. He's got access to the scriptures. Not everyone did. He's read the Bible from cover to cover numerous times, and he can't find indulgences in the Bible. And so he's going to do something about that. And won't the pope and the bishop be glad that he did? He was incredibly naive. And so he wrote down, he went back to his monk's cell, and he hammered out 95 theses, 95 arguments against the abuses of the medieval Catholic theological system dealing with indulgences primarily, but not just that. And then he invited his colleagues to a colloquy, which is a theological discussion. Um, and he took them to the church door in the town of Wittenberg at the university and banged them up on the door October 31st, 1517, which is when scholars date the beginning of the Reformation. He was inviting the faculty in Wittenberg to come and argue the pros and cons of this whole system with him. Unbeknownst to him, some of his students had 
plucked them down off of the wall and taken them to a printer, translated them into German, and now they're going out to all of Germany, and everybody who can read German is now reading about what Luther is saying about the church. The Pope was very annoyed. The bishop was very annoyed. Um, the Pope, in fact, uh, talked to the emperor, and they demanded that Luther present himself uh, to the Pope in Rome for a trial. And Luther, God bless him, he had a protector. And his name was Frederick the Wise. He was an elector, the princes of Germany who get to vote for the Holy Roman Emperor. And so his elector went in to negotiate for him. And he said, no, we're, we want to change a venue. Luther's not going to get a fair trial in Rome. Uh, we want to have the trial held somewhere in Germany. And they picked out a little backwater town called Worms. Worms. Somebody who's German, help me here. Worms, which he said. OK. Um, and so uh, they, they had this trial there in Worms. So he shows up. And the, he is being prosecuted by um, Johann von Eck, who is an associate of the Archbishop of Trier in France. They don't like the Germans. This guy's putting a spoke in the wheels. He's messing everything up. This is outrageous. And so it's kind of a kangaroo court. Eck lays out all of Luther's writings. This has been going on now for some years while Frederick the Wise is negotiating with the Vatican and with the emperor where to hold this trial. So they invite Luther in. Now, in this hall is Charles V of Spain, the Holy Roman Emperor, in all of his regalia. And there are all of the princes of the electors of the German people. There are the representatives of the free state. There are the princes, the bishops of the church, the archbishops of the church, and the princes of the church, the cardinals, all arrayed in all of their fancy stuff. And there they're all sitting around. And in comes Luther in his brown monk's cowl with a rope belt and his sandals. And he looks around. And he is in way over his head. And Eck asked him, are these your writings? So he takes him to the table. And he looks at his writings. And yes, they're mine. Uh, are you prepared to recant your heresies? Uh-oh. This is a heresy trial. In the Middle Ages, that's not a good thing. A hundred years previously, uh, the Bohemian reformer, Jan Hus, was uh, condemned to burn at the stake by the, Constant, by the Council of Constance because, among other things, he argued against indulgences. Yikes. So Luther now begins to understand the seriousness of this. This isn't a discussion so that we can say, what does the scripture say? This is, um, I'm on trial for my life. Realizing that, he asks leave, can I have 24 hours to prepare a formal response? And they gave it to him. So they gather together on the next day, and there they are uh, at his trial. And he stands up before the emperor, and he says this. Since then, your serene majesty and your lordships seek a simple answer, I will give it in this manner, neither with tooth or with horn. Unless I am convinced by the testimony of the scriptures or by clear reason, for I do not trust popes and councils because they have been shown to err and contradict one another, I am bound by the scriptures that I have quoted in my writings, and my conscience is captive to the word of God. I cannot and I will not retract anything since it is neither safe nor right to go against conscience. So he's standing up against the Holy Roman Emperor. He's standing up against the Pope and all of the bishops and all of the princes. Luther is now an outlaw in the eyes of the law, the civil law, the secular law. He's a heretic in the eyes of the church. And as soon as he is caught and people can put hands on him, he will be burned at the stake. So what's to do? He made a deal, Frederick the Wise, the elector, made a deal with the, the emperor that Luther would have free passage to Worms and back home again to Wittenberg. So on his way back to Wittenberg, the pope kept his word. I'm uh, not the pope. The, the emperor kept his word. Luther's making his way back to Wittenberg when he was accosted and kidnapped by robbers, henchmen of Frederick the Wise, 
who grabbed him up off of the road to save his life, and they took him to Wartburg Castle and locked him in the tower for several years. While in the tower, he translated the scriptures, Old and New Testaments, into German so that people in Germany would have the scriptures in their language that they could read, that it would be mass produced and produced cheaply so people could have Bibles. Oh, he has really kicked the hornet's nest now. So we're celebrating today his stand on the word of God. We believe, and this is what the reformers to a man believed, that we are saved by five S's, the solas of the Reformation. Solas Christus, we are saved by the person and work of Christ. We don't save ourselves. We don't contribute to our salvation. Christ does everything that's necessary for us to be saved. We receive what he has done for us by his grace. Sola gratia, his grace. He gives us a gift. We receive that gift by faith, sola fide. We get it by faith. We don't earn it. We don't do good works. We receive a gift by faith. And how do we know these things? Sola scriptura, by the scriptures alone. We understand that the scriptures are God's revelation to humanity. God spoke through, if you read Hebrews 1, you don't need to turn there, but he spoke to us in previous times and in various ways and through the prophets. Most recently and most completely, he has spoken to us in the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ. But how do we know about his person and his work? Through the scriptures of the Old and New Testament. I'm a pastor in the Evangelical Covenant Church. That's who holds my credentials, my standing, and it, it traces its history back to the Reformation, and we say this about the Bible. The Bible of the Old and New Testaments is the infallible Word of God, and it is the, I like this, only, sola, only perfect rule of Christian faith, doctrine, and conduct. So what do we have? How do we know about what God has done for us? It's been revealed to us. God's not holding out on us. It's not a mystery. He's told us. How do we get saved? How do we get right with God? Well, he's told us how to do that. So it doesn't matter who else, whether it's popes or whether it's councils or whether it's tradition or whatever else it is. No, Luther says, by clear reason, he gave me a brain, and by the scriptures, he gave me the Bible, we're able to figure this out. Sorry about this, but I went to seminary. I've got to get my money's worth. This is known as the doctrine of the perspicuity of scripture. Scripture is crystal clear. It's plain. It's self-authenticating. It is authoritative. It is self-interpreting. You want to understand what the scriptures teach? You read it in its entirety. You don't pluck a verse here and pluck a verse there. I love G.K. Chesterton, who said that when you do that, pluck a verse here and pluck a verse there. If you torture the Bible enough, you can get it to confess to anything. We don't want to torture the Bible. We want to listen for God's voice in the scriptures. How is it that we're saved? How do we come to faith? So what is it that we believe? God speaks to us. It's revealed in two ways. So if you'll turn in your Bibles to Romans 1, there, is, there are two kinds of revelation. There is general revelation or natural revelation. And this is what Paul is talking about in Romans 1, beginning at verse 18. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who by their unrighteousness suppress the truth. They suppress the truth about God. For what can be known about God is plain to them because God has shown it to them. He's revealed it so that human beings don't have any excuse. God's made himself known that there is a God, that that's not disputable, at least according to Paul and according to the scriptures. For, his invisible, for God has shown it to them. For his invisible attributes, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen or perceived ever since the creation of the world and the things that have been made so that humanity is without an excuse. You can't say there is no God. Why? Because as the psalmist says, Psalm 19, the heavens are declaring the handiwork of God. We got up a few minutes ago and we confessed together the faith of the church. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker, creator of heaven and earth. Our universe screams out that there was a creator, that it is orderly, that, that, he, that there's something about God that we can know, that he is powerful, that he created this thing, that he has given us an aesthetic sense. 
so that we see a mountain vista and we are moved. We see a beautiful sunset and we are moved. Where does that come from? This is God's general revelation. It's general in content, it's the creation, and it's general aimed at a certain audience. It's aimed at everybody. Everybody gets to have that bit of revelation. Now, that doesn't save us. That doesn't tell us about the work of Christ and the person of Christ. So there's another kind of revelation that does that, and that's called special revelation. If you'll flip over to 2 Timothy chapter 3, if you're using a pew Bible, you'll find that on page 996. Paul is writing to his disciple Timothy, and this is special revelation. Here's what he says, beginning in verse 14 of chapter 3. But as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing from whom you have learned it, and how from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings which are able to make you wise to salvation through faith in Jesus Christ. We're saved by faith. That's the Reformation. And we know this because the scriptures make us wise to salvation. Why was this given to us? Why was this written? Why did God reveal it? To tell us how he made the earth? No. This is not a science textbook. How to drive our car? No. This is not a driver's manual. To make us wise to salvation, God communicates to us what is necessary for us to come to faith in Jesus Christ, to believe in him. John, in chapter 20, verse 31 of his gospel, he says this, These things I have written to you in order that you might, have, that you might believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in Jesus Christ, faith, by believing in Jesus Christ, that you will have life, eternal life, that you will be saved. This book is for us to understand how to get right with God, what's wrong with us, what's right with God, and how do we get into right relationship with Him. That's what the argument at the Reformation was all about. And this is a question in our culture. Is there any authority at all for anyone? The lady on the airplane, my little joke, she believed the Bible. She had an authority. The man sitting next to her is a product of our day and age. I mean, I don't believe in anything, and I mock anybody who believes something, and I mock your authority. And this isn't new. Um, I went to school in Greensboro, and if you couldn't tell, I was a history major. I'm sorry about that. Um, and I was the president of InterVarsity Christian Fellowship at Guilford College, and one of my cabinet members invited Dave Bills, the pastor of New Garden Friends Meeting, the Quaker, it was a Quaker school, the Quaker pastor, um, to come and speak to our fellowship. Well, Quakers are all about, how did they get their name? They sit in silence, and they wait for a movement of the Holy Spirit, and when the Spirit comes upon them, they begin to shake and quake, and that's how they got their name. And so for him, he came to explain to us the glories of Quakerism and that as Christians, our ultimate authority is personal religious experience. For a Quaker, that's what it is. <sighs> well, I wasn't happy with that answer. So I was trying to get him to say the Bible. Um, but he wouldn't say the Bible. So I said, tell me again, what is our authority? And he said, personal religious experience. Well... I love Jesus. And in God's providence, that week in the newspaper in Greensboro, a guy had stolen a potato chip truck. He'd stripped off all his clothes. He's naked. He covered himself with mustard. And he's driving around Greensboro covered in mustard in a stolen potato chip truck. And when the police arrested him and asked him, why did you do this? He said, because God told me to. Oh, my goodness. So, Dave... What you're telling me is that this man heard the word of God and that we're all supposed to get naked and drive around with mustard all over ourselves, right? Is that what you're telling him? Oh, no, 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 no. No, what he should have done when he got that word from God is check it out with his community and talk to others. Well, I'm old, and I went to school in the late 1970s, and you might remember Jim Jones in Jonestown in Guyana. He had 1,000 followers who all decided to drink the Kool-Aid. How many people in his community have to decide what's right and what's wrong? And so I, I, I see what you're saying. So Dave, how about the scriptures? Well, no, he's not going there. He, he, wouldn't, he wouldn't say the scriptures. What is our authority? Is it what the church as a group of people teach and think about God? No, it's what 
at least for Protestants, and that's what we're celebrating this month, at least for Protestants, it is sola scriptura, the scriptures alone. It is God's revelation to us. So, in honor of the Reformation, in honor of uh, the Reformers this month, we believe that we are saved by Christ alone, by grace alone, through faith alone. We know it by scriptures alone. If you come back next week, you'll get the last one. Soli Deo Gloria, to the glory of God alone. If all of this, what I've been telling you, is true, then who gets the glory? God does, because it's God's deal from beginning to end. And this is what the church the early church fathers believed this, and this is what the reformers believed, and this is what the church until lately believes about the Christian faith. Sola Scriptura. Amen.